Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. In this video, we'll finish up our discussion of stoichiometry by looking at some concepts that have practical applications in lots of areas of modern research. If you're interested in environmental chemistry, you'll be able to use what we talk about today whenever you're studying minerals in a river, pollution in the atmosphere, or nutrients in soil. To get there, let's start by looking at a few common chemicals you might have heard of. Formaldehyde is used as a preservative to keep tissue from decomposing. It used to be used to store animals for dissection in science classes, but it's pretty toxic, so we usually use other chemicals for that now. Acetic acid is the main ingredient in vinegar, and it's what gives vinegar its distinctive smell. Lactic acid is what gives sour milk its sour taste. A derivative of lactic acid is also produced in your muscles when you exercise. It's partly responsible for making your muscles sore after a good workout. The next chemical I want to look at is ribose. Ribose is a sugar, and it's an important building block of DNA. You might know that DNA is short for deoxyribonucleic acid. The ribo in ribonucleic is because a derivative of this sugar, ribose, is part of the structure of all DNA. And the last compound I want to talk to you about is glucose, which is also called blood sugar. It's probably the most important carbohydrate in your body and in every living thing, and you'll learn a lot about glucose in your biology courses. You can see that these five compounds are all very different from each other, Formaldehyde and glucose certainly don't have much in common. But if you look at the molecular formulas of these compounds, you'll notice that they do share a connection. First, the compounds all contain just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But more importantly for us, all of them have their carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in the same ratio. One carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. That means they all have the same empirical formula. The empirical formula is just the smallest whole number ratio between the elements in a compound. So all these compounds have different molecular formulas, but they have the same empirical formula, which is CH2O. You might think that knowing the empirical formula of a compound isn't very helpful. It's the molecular formula that tells us what a compound actually is, and that's definitely way more useful. But it turns out that many of the experiments we do actually tell us the empirical formula of a compound. For example, environmental scientists are often concerned about pollutants in rivers and lakes. Now when a coal mine or copper mine is abandoned, it often fills with water because the mine shaft extends down below the water table. The exposed minerals in the mine dissolve in the water, and then it flows out of the mine and into nearby rivers and lakes. As a result, the water becomes toxic, and it often has a bright orange or bluish-green color, depending on what minerals are dissolved in the water. This can be a real hazard for animals that live in that water or drink from it, so it's something that environmental scientists study very carefully. Here's a photo of some analysts taking samples of water from a lake near an abandoned mine. They'll try to identify compounds that they find in the water, but the test they use might not immediately tell them the molecular formulas of the things they find. Instead, many tests just tell you what elements the compounds are made of, and that information comes in the form of percentages. For example, suppose you used a test like this to identify the compound water itself. It would tell you the compound you're looking at contains just hydrogen and oxygen, and it would tell you the percentage of each. So what would be the percentage of oxygen? It wouldn't be 33 and a third percent. It's true that water molecules contain two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen, but the percentages you get from this kind of experiment are percentages by weight. So to get the percent of oxygen, you take the mass of oxygen and divide by the mass of the whole molecule, then multiply by 100 to make it a percentage. If we look at the periodic table, we find out that oxygen weighs 
15.9994 grams per mole. So that goes in our numerator. And we find out that a whole water molecule weighs 18.0151 grams per mole. When we perform the calculation, we find that the percent of oxygen in water is 88.8112%. Notice that I used the correct number of significant figures in my answer here. Don't forget to do that when you're answering questions on a test or in the homework. It's worth points. Now what if I wanted to know the percentage of hydrogen in water instead of oxygen? We'd set it up the same way, but there's an important difference. In the numerator, we put the mass of hydrogen. From the periodic table, we find that it's 1.00784 grams per mole. But remember that there are two of these in water, so we have to multiply that mass by two. In the denominator is the mass of water, which we already calculated last time. That gives us a percentage of 11.1888% for the hydrogen. If you compare the percentages that we got for oxygen and hydrogen, you'll find out that they add up to 100%. Actually, this shouldn't be surprising. Water only contains oxygen and hydrogen, so they should total 100%. So let's get back to our experiment where we're testing water that we think might be polluted. The data we get might look like this. A compound we discovered contains 29.7% iron, 19.2% carbon, and 51.1% oxygen. We'd like to know what this compound is, but we can't tell just by looking at these percentages. Not yet, anyway. But with a little effort, we can figure out the empirical formula. That's why the empirical formula can be very useful. So remember, the empirical formula tells us the ratio between the numbers of each element in the compound. For example, earlier we saw the empirical formula CH2O. That means that for every mole of carbon, there are two moles of hydrogen and one mole of oxygen. But the percentages we have tell us the mass of each element, not the number of moles. To get from the masses to moles, we'll need a conversion factor. So let's start with the iron. Our compound contains 29.7% iron. That means if our sample weighed 100 grams, the iron would weigh 29.7% of that, which is 29.7 grams. To change that to moles, we use the conversion factor, which we get from the periodic table. One mole of iron weighs 55.845 grams. We want grams to cancel, so we'll put the 55.845 in the denominator, and we get 0.532 moles. We can do the same for the carbon and oxygen. If our total sample weighs 100 grams, then the carbon weighs 19.2 grams, and the oxygen weighs 51.1. Using conversion factors in the periodic table, we find out that we have 1.60 moles of carbon and 3.19 moles of oxygen. So now we know how many moles of each element we have. Unfortunately, chemical formulas must always have whole numbers of subscripts. We can't have a formula like Fe with a subscript 0.532, C 1.60, and O 3.19. To figure out the whole number ratio between the three, we divide all of them by the smallest of the three numbers. If we're lucky, that'll give us three integers, which we can use as the subscripts in our formula. So let's try it. The smallest number is 0.532 moles. So we'll divide all three numbers by that. That gives us 1.00 for iron, 3.01 for carbon, and 6.00 for oxygen. So that gave us three integers, at least to the first decimal place. And that means our empirical formula is FeC3O6. That example worked out very well, but sometimes we're not so lucky. 
Suppose that after dividing by the smallest number in that last step, we got 1.00 for iron, 3.49 for carbon, and 6.00 for oxygen. This time, we didn't get three integers. The one for carbon is way off. But you'll notice that the number we did get for carbon is basically three and a half. We can change that to an integer by multiplying it by two. If we multiply by two, we have to do it for all three elements. So we end up with 2.00 for the iron, 6.98 for the carbon, and 12.0 for the oxygen. So our empirical formula is Fe2C7O12. You'll find that situations like this do happen occasionally whenever you're determining an empirical formula. After dividing by the smallest number of moles, the ratio you get will have some integers, but one or two of the numbers might be off by a half, a third, or two thirds. When that happens, you should simply multiply all the results you got by a number to get rid of the fraction. If you have a result that is off by a half, as we had in our example, you multiply them all by two. If you have a result that's off by a third or two thirds, you multiply everything by three. In our class, you shouldn't have examples where one of the results has a fraction other than one half or one third. So back to the example we had before, where we found our compound has an empirical formula of Fe C3O6. That's the empirical formula, but with just one more piece of information, we can also get the molecular formula. All we need to know is the molecular weight of the compound. That's something that many kinds of experiment can tell us, so it's a piece of data we can usually have. For example, let's say that the molecular weight of our compound is 375.747 grams per mole. To find out what the molecular formula is, let's compare that weight with the weight of our empirical formula. If we use the periodic table, we find that FeC3O6 weighs 187.874 grams per mole. If you divide the molecular weight by the 187.874, you get 2. So the molecular formula is just two times the empirical formula. So that means our compound has a molecular formula of Fe2C6O12. One thing to notice is that it's quite possible for the molecular formula to be the same as the empirical formula. For example, suppose the molecular weight had been 187.874 grams per mole in that last problem. In that case, it would have been the same as the mass of the empirical formula. So the molecular formula would also have been FeC3O6. As you just saw, determining an empirical formula can take a little time. It gets much easier and faster after you've done it a few times, so you should try the homework problems that give you the percent composition of the elements in a compound and ask you to determine the empirical formula. We'll also have some practice doing that in class, but the important thing is to practice these before the exam so that it won't take you as much time anymore when you're taking the test. And if you're in my class, the test is probably coming up soon. So good luck, and please come ask me if you have any trouble or get stuck on a problem. In the meantime, have a good week.